I want to talk about a computational explanation for domain specificity in the human visual system. So um, let's start with the problem. What is the problem that vision needs to solve? And so from a brief glimpse of this complex scene here, we quickly and seamlessly effortlessly recognize people and objects and their relationship to each other and the overall gist of the scene. And in the brain, when we look at this face, for example, the 2D pattern of lights entering our eyes is processed through different stages until we come up with the abstract representation of the face, such as this is Anna. So how does the visual system solve this? How does visual recognition work in humans? And despite the wealth of empirical data collected in the last decades, it's actually still unclear whether the precise computations and representations at each of those processing stages and why. However, it is something that we learned about how the brain solves visual recognition. And that is that these processing stages do not seem to be the same for all visual categories. In fact, many labs in the last decades have discovered functionally specialized areas in the ventral pathway. So for example, if you show subjects in the fMRI faces and objects, some areas in the ventral pathway respond selectively to faces compared to any other visual category. And the same has been found for places or bodies or visual words. And while we learned a lot about what these specialized neural populations are doing and whether they're causally involved in these tasks and so on, some big questions actually remain open. The first thing, why do we function specialization for these categories um, and not others? And second, why is functional specialization a good design strategy for brains in the first place? And I think we all agree that we would only expect functional specialization for tasks that we either do on a daily basis so that are modern life important or that have been important to our ancestors or during evolution, okay? Um, however, that constraint alone seems to under constrain the functional specializations that we find in the virtual system. So for example, when uh, labs went on to find, to see whether there's functional specialization for cars, which, which we have a lot of um, you know, daily experience with, it seems like there's no evidence for that. Or food as an example for you know, a task that we do from you know, basically the, the earliest days we're born, it was important to our ancestors, we need to discriminate food all the time. There's also no evidence for functional specialization of that. Or other more evolutionary important categories, such as snakes or spiders. Um, could also not be found. So here what we want to um, propose or test is that maybe on top of um, being modern life and or evolutionarily important, there are computational reasons for why these categories um, specialize and others don't. So to be uh, a bit more precise, the hypothesis that we're testing here is that the domain-specific organization in the human ventral pathway reflects the computational optimization for the real world tasks that humans solve, okay? Um, and so this is not a new hypothesis. It has been out there um, since a long time. You know, Mar talked about it and others. However, um, until now there was basically no mean or no tool to test this hypothesis in a computational system that um, was anywhere near human level performance in these tasks. And that suddenly changed with the rise of convolutional networks or CNNs in computer science. So in 2012, Kuchevsky and al um, developed AlexNet, a CNN optimized to classify images into object categories. And critically, CNNs are image computable, meaning that they can be trained on natural images like the image of this orange here, okay? And this image then gets put through a cascade of operations, extracting features of the image, pulling those together, and eventually classifying the object category. And this particular architecture, AlexNet, won um, the most important computer vision challenge at that time, and each following year, another CNN won that challenge until by 2015, CNNs achieved near human level accuracy in the task of object categorization. And I just wanna emphasize here, that they're still far away from other aspects of human level visual recognition, but they're really good at categorizing objects. Uh, and so CNNs have been really useful in a big advance, not just in computer vision, but also for human cognitive neuroscience. Uh, and the reason for that is that these computational models are actually inspired by the visual processing hierarchy. So in the last few years, several dozens of papers have been published showing a high similarity between the features extracted at the different layers um, of a CNN and the different processing stages in the human brain. And this is exciting because for the first time, we have image computable models now of how human visual recognition might work in the brain. So let's use them to test our hypothesis about functional specialization. 
So the work I'm presenting you today has been, uh, you know, work with Nancy, Nancy Kenrisher, supervised by Nancy Kenrisher, together with Alex Kell, Julio Martinez, and Michael Cohen. Um, and I want to particularly focus today on the case of faces, or face specialization in the human visual system, but all these um, techniques actually can transfer to all other visual categories as well. So there are two main questions that we had at the beginning. The first one was, um, from a computational point of view, do face and object processing require distinct computations? Um, um, yeah, so are there, are there, do they require distinct computations, or can we train on one, uh, on one task and do the, the computations then also transfer to the other tasks? So. And then as a second question, we wanted to see what happens if we train a system on both of these tasks? Can the representations, can, is there a set of representations that can be learned to support both of these tasks or not? To better understand, is there computational uh, reason for why these things should be separated? Okay. So, and to understand whether face and object tasks require distinct computations, we trained two systems on these two different tasks. So we took a standard AlexNet architecture, uh, trained it randomly from scratch on, um, uh, on, on face identity. So we used around 1700 identities from the VGG phase two data set and trained that model from scratch until there was no more proven in performance using standard um, training and optimization parameters. Um, and then we had another AlexNet architecture. So the same architecture, now we trained that um, and optimized it on object categorization. So what we did is we took 423 categories uh, from the ImageNet data set that were prototypical objects. So we removed all the scenes and, and animals um, and, and other categories from that data set uh, and left only prototypical objects. Uh, and importantly, we matched the images between these two data sets such um, that the, the training set for the, both of these networks was the same. And now how can we find out whether a network trained on one task can also do the other? So what we did is we had a set of 100 held out identities. So these were face identities the network had never seen before, it, where they weren't included in the training, 10 images each, 1,000 images in total. We showed them to the network and then extracted the activations from the penultimate layer, FC7. So we get a, a pattern, um, a feature vector basically for every of those images. And then we also had 100 held up object categories that we took from the things database um, that we trained the object scene, uh, that we showed to the object CNN and extracted those activations. Um, and then we also showed the object images to the face CNN and the face images to the object CNN. Okay, so we also got the same patterns now for object images. So now in order to find out whether um, these features are useful to do both tasks, um, we trained a support vector machine um, to decode the 100 face identities. So the idea was basically take those features, keep them constant, and just vary the readout and see um, which ones are more useful to decode faces when we take the activations from the face CNN or the ones from the object CNN. Okay, so on the y-axis here, um, you see the decoding accuracy, how well we can decode faces. So let's look at the features uh, extracted from the face CNN first. And that's what we see here. So we can really well decode face identities using the features from the face CNN. So what happens if we take the features from the object CNN? You know, does this generically trained object CNN, you know, is, is something like face identification something that just emerges and falls off of training on object categorization, or does it perform worse than the face CNN? And that's what we see here. So the object CNN is definitely above chance level, so chance level is 1% here, um, but it performs, the performance is much worse than when we use the activations or the features from the face CNN. And we can do the same thing for the object decoding, and here we find the exact opposite. So now the features from the object CNN are very useful to decode objects, while the features from the face CNN are not as useful. So we find that the face train network does not do well on the object task and vice versa, um, and basically showing here a double dissociation, um, just like we see it in the brain, that a system optimized to do faces cannot do objects really well on the other way around. So do phase and object processing require distinct computations? This analysis um, suggests, yes, the representations are actually suboptimal for the other task, uh, suggesting that that is a potential reason of why, why these things are segregated in the brain. Okay. But then um, what we didn't test yet is whether there is a set of representations that can be learned if you train a system on both of these tasks simultaneously. Okay. So that's what we wanted to understand in the next question. Can representations be learned to support both tasks? So in addition, to those um, two uh, separate 
uh, CNNs, the face CNN and the object CNN, we also introduced a fully shared dual task CNN. Um, and that technique has actually been nicely introduced by Kaladel in 2018, where they use that in the auditory system to look at task segregation of word and music tasks. And we want to transfer this now to the visual system and ask, okay, how about face and objects? Um, and so the idea basically is you take the same architecture and the only thing you change is you add another classification layer, one for the face classes and one for the object classes. And then you train that network again on alternating batches of face images and object images and face images and object images till again, um, um, their, um, the training of the loss uh, reaches an asymptote. So there's no more improvement in, 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 in learning. Um, and then the hypothesis is that if that network discovered a shared feature set to do both tasks, it should achieve the same performance as the face or the object only network. And if it cannot, and that is our hypothesis, we actually expect that the fully shared network does, not, does do worse than the separate networks. So um, let's see what we find. What we're looking at here now is the test performance. So in this case now we can directly go and look at the test performance, which is based on an independent set of images that we have from all the classes that the face network and the object network have been trained on, um, but they have never been seen during training. Um, and that's the, the red bar shows you the performance from the face only CNN and in yellow the performance on the object categorization from the object only CNN. But now what we really want to know is, okay, how does their dual task network perform, right? The network that has been trained on both tasks, we get two performances from the same network, one for the faces, one for the objects. Okay? And the idea being, if that network discovered a shared representation, the performance would be very similar to what we have with the face and object only. If it failed at finding such a shared set of representations, um, a set of shared representations, performance should drop. And that's exactly what we find. So we basically see that there is a large drop in performance when trying to share these two tasks in one system, in particular for the face task. So it seems that face and object tests cannot be performed well in one network, suggesting that that, is, that might be a potential reason for why these things should be segregated if you want to perform well on them. Okay. However, um, that's also not really what we have in the brain. In the brain, we don't see that um, nothing is shared or everything is shared, what we actually have. And what we see in the brain is that early visual processing can be shared across these tasks, like face and object in the early visual system. But then at some later mid-level processing stage, these tasks diverge. So we wanted to find out whether that is the case um, in, in our system as well. So we basically asked what happens if we share a little less or even a little less or you know, even a little less, at what point would we achieve the same performance as a network that has only been optimized to do faces and objects? Or you know, do we maybe have to go all the way back and they basically cannot share anything in the system, which would not be very biological. Um, and so that's what I'm showing you here now. Um, you see on the, on the X axis, you see the different, um, different networks that we trained with different branch positions. So the network either um, branched at a very early stage and didn't share much, or the branch at a very late stage and shared almost everything. Now we're comparing the performance for the face test to the network that has only been trained on faces. So that's, that's our baseline, basically, the performance that we want to achieve. Okay. So let's see what that looks like. And what we see is that we can basically share the first convolutional layers up to um, three or four without uh, and, and achieve very similar performance to the face only network, but if we try to share more, then the performance starts to drop. We can look at the same thing for the object task, and here we see a very similar pattern, sharing up to sharing the first three or four layers is fine, and then performance will drop. So it seems like early processing stages can actually be shared between those tasks, like in the human visual system. And actually, yeah. Um, and so can representations be learned to support both tasks? We find not without a cost of sharing, at least for the late uh, or after mid-level stage processes, early, early layers can be, can be shared, okay? And that being you know, a st strong supportive for, strongly supportive for the idea that um, there, it is computational, it computationally makes sense to distinguish, to separate these two tasks into different systems if you want to perform well on them. Okay, but now um, we've looked at one architecture. This is AlexNet. Um, it's a very early um, network in terms of the history of, of CNNs, uh, and there's been much, much development here. So we wanted to see, do these results, are they particular to AlexNet, do they generalize to, larger net to other networks in particular, do they generalize to larger network, more layers, uh, more features in every layer? 
and so on. Um, uh, and that's um, you know, important to find out. So we, um, we, we trained another architecture. We used VDG16, which is a much deeper network, has way more layers, um, uh, more features in every layer, and it also performs better than AlexNet on several benchmarks. So we trained this architecture again on the face and the object task. And then critically, um, so this, and that's their performance here, the test performance again for those two networks. So we find that the overall performance is better than for AlexNet as to be expected. But critically now, um, we also trained this dual task network using this large network now, um, um, also trained it on faces and objects. And now I wanted to see, okay, how about this network? Would this also show a cost of sharing? So a drop in performance when we try to do one at both tasks in the same system, or would this network maybe be able to do it? And this is what we find. And this was, to be honest, very surprising to us. So we basically saw there was no difference in performance if you train this, this architecture, this large system on one task or both tasks simultaneously, okay? So phase and object tasks can be shared in larger systems. Well, why not in the brain? So far with IR hypothesis, you know, if um, that, that sort of like, you know, suggests that this network discovered uh, a shared set of um, uh, features to do both tasks, so that cannot be a reason for why these things are segregated in the brain, right? That's one hypothesis. Another one is that we thought about then is what if this network actually spontaneously discovered task segregation? So what if hidden in those layers, units started to specialize on face processing or object processing? And, uh, and that's how this network um, achieved this, this, um, the performance, okay? So we wanted to find out whether that is true, so we started to perform lesion experiments in that dual task network. And I just wanna you know, quickly uh, emphasize here how cool it is to have these systems that you have full access to and you can basically very cheaply and quickly perform things as lesion experiments to look at causal involvement of different layers or units in the network, something that would be very hard or if not impossible to do in the brain. Okay, and so the idea was basically that we wanted, if we wanna find out whether a certain filter is involved uh, in, in the phase task or the object task, we can just lesion it and look at the performance and see how does that perfect, affect the performance in both tasks. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the basic idea. So we took that dual task network um, and dropped every single feature map one by one in all the convolutional layers and showed it batches of face images. Okay, and then we compute with these batches of face images, we compute the loss um, to see when dropping that particular feature map, how does that affect the loss? Does the loss increase? Is it important for the task? Um, does, it, does it not change? Um, it, it doesn't seem to be important for the task. So we did this for every single um, convolution layer. And I'm just showing you one example layer here. So we basically um, get a loss associated with dropping every of those feature maps in this layer. And then we can sort them or uh, rank them basically according to the loss that they, that they, um, the, the effect that they had on the face task. Um, and then what we can do to find out whether that sorting is really task specific. So right now we only know that, you know, these, these feature maps are important for the face test, but they could also be important for the object test. We haven't ruled that out. So what we do then is we drop the entire like best 10% or best 20% and check the performance on an independent test set. So the test set that, the, that we have for those, uh, for the, those networks um, and, and test whether when we drop those, um, those units according to the sorting, will this only affect the face performance or will it also affect the, the object performance? And then we can do the same thing on object batches. So show the network objects, we find the same thing using, uh, so we can, we can do the same thing and get an object sorting now ranked for how important they are for the object task. So now the important question, does a larger system segregate both tasks? So what we do, and I'm showing you one example layer here, it's a late layer, so if there's segregation, it should should have been occurred at that layer. Um, um, so what I'm showing you here is how we, we drop the feature maps zero, from zero to 50% and 10% stats. Uh, also on the y-axis you see the performance on that independent test set. And the, the gray line shows you what happens when we randomly drop um, units. And you see that these layers are actually pretty robust to dropping um, feature maps um, um, in, and the performance is not very much affected. So what happens if we use the face sorting now? This is what we see then. So we can actually drastically impact um, the performance in the face test by using those face ranked units that we rank to be important for the face test. Um, but what happens if you use the object sorting, maybe that is also effective in, in doing that, but it's actually not 
not, um, not, not nearly as much as when we use the face sorting. We can look at the same thing for the object task. So using the object sorting, uh, we can affect the object task much more than using the face sorting. So it seems there is evidence for functional segregation of phase and object processing in these larger networks, um, which was really exciting for us to see. Um, but then obviously that's just one layer. So what we want to know is at which processing stage does that arise? Like, uh, is that just from the beginning? Does it come at some point in the middle? Um, so we somehow needed to quantify this for every single layer. So uh, we decided to drop 20% uh, of the like highly ranked face um, uh, units according to the face sorting in every single convolution layer and measure the performance on the face and object task. So that's what I'm showing you here now. On the x-axis, you see the different layers from comp 1 to comp 13. That's, and here on the y-axis, you see the normalized performance. So um, that's normalized to show you the proportional drop, how, how much using the dropping the 20% face units affects, proportionally affects the face versus the object task. Okay, so let's start with the object task. And that's what we see here. So in the early layers, we actually impact object task a lot. We're suddenly around layer four or five that changes. And so now dropping the units according to the face sorting doesn't impact the performance of the object task as much anymore. So now what happens, what, how does this look like for the face task? Um, and here we see um, a similar and different pattern. So basically what we see is that we can also impact the face task a lot in the early layers. But as you can see, this is not task specific. We impact the phase task as much as the object task. However, after some comp six, comp seven layer, these two curves start to diverge. And now we impact the phase task while we don't impact the object task, okay? So we wanted to put that into some, um, some index, just um, you know, transform this into a, a single number. So we defined a task specificity index, which is just a ratio between the proportional drop that we have on the face task versus the object task, so that ratio should be high when it's, um, in, when it's impacting the face task much more than the object task. And that's what this ratio looks like when you plot it over all the different layers. Um, and so you can really clearly see that um, the specificity index starts to, to ra rise um, after layer comp seven and goes up to six, which means we can impact the face performance up to six times more than the object performance here. And just as a side note, um, we did a control where we um, matched the performance between these two tasks. So we didn't have to normalize the performance um, and we found the exact same thing. So this is not, um, uh, this selectivity index is not driven by overall mean differences in the performance of the two tasks. So, uh, you know, the important take home here is that there's segregation of phase and object processing um, that spontaneously emerges after some mid-level processing stage like in the human visual system, and very consistent with the results that we found for AlexNet too. So we can update this question, can representations be learned to support both tasks and add larger networks actually spontaneously segregate both tasks uh, and, 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 and can share these two tasks um, by, by sharing, by, by, by segregating these two tasks in the network, um, which is on, on some sense even more exciting because we didn't have to impose you know, a, a, a branching structure on this or something, the network just discovered um, that segregation is a good thing to do in order to maintain a high performance. Okay, and that really giving, um, you know, a strong support for the idea that there is, that it does make computational sense to segregate these two tasks also in the, uh, in the brain. Um, however, there's another important thing we have to do that you might have thought about as well, what about other tasks? Do any do two tasks require distinct computations? Um, so um, obviously we wanted to test that to see, you know, what happens. Um, is this something that is really particular to faces, or would 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 we would we find this in for any any pair of two tasks? And so we thought about what would be good to control task. And the first thing we came up with was food, for which we think it has really relevance to our daily life, but still we don't see functional segregation in the brain. So we used, um, and we found this food 101 data set, and we trained a network um, on foods and objects simultaneously. Um, so there's 101 categories of, of different types of food. We trained this, performed the exact same analysis to find out whether these two tasks would segregate. But then we also wanted to have a control task that is more fine-grained, more similar in that sense to faces than food is, which is still a pretty heterogeneous task. Um, so we also included cars. 
um, for, for which, again, we um, don't see factual specialization. There's no evidence for factual specialization in the brain. Um, so we had this car data set with 1,100 categories, really fine-grained model make discrimination, and we trained the network on, on this car task and object task to find out whether this would maybe segregate, um, whether, when it's also another fine-grained task. Okay? And then importantly, I just want to mention that we match this always to another face and object scene and to, um, train on the, on the same data set size. And also very important, the object task that we had um, in, these, in these networks never included any food classes or car classes or, or face classes, okay? Um, and so it was, um, there was no, no bias in, in that sense. So do any two tasks require distant computations? That's what we found, um, just a reminder, that's what, we, what I showed you before for faces and objects. Here our task specificity index. So now we want to see what does this look like for food and objects. And here we find a very different curve. We basically also see that we impact the food task more than the object task, but not much. And that proportion seems to be pretty stable across all the layers. And in fact, the later we go in the network, the less we impact these two tasks. So when we, like, when we look at their selectivity index, we see there's much, much um, the specificity index, there's much less segregation, and if anything, it arises pretty late in the network. Now the same thing for cars, where we have another fine-grained discrimination task, and that again looks very similar to the food task. Um, and uh, also when we look at their specificity index, we find um, that there's much less segregation, even for this task. Um, um, for this fine-grained task, uh, and it accused of anything much later in the network. So food and car processing show less segregation than faces and objects, showing that this is not just the case for every task, right? It is something that seems to be particular to um, the face task in these comparisons. So do any two tasks require distinct computations? Which, which looked at food and cars for which we don't see functional specialization, uh, and, uh, and found that foods and cars actually segregate less than, than faces. Um, and um, yeah, so I um, think, or I just want to you know, summarize this by, by saying basically these findings suggest that from a computational point of view, it makes sense to segregate faces, but not other tasks such as food and cars. Um, you know, strongly supporting the hypothesis that there might be um, a reason for why these things are also segregated in the brain. Uh, and while this was a really normative approach that we took here, we basically just asked if we take a system and train it on objects and faces, would that system also segregate these two tasks? We obviously also want to bring that back to human behavior in the brain. Um, and I have some initial results on, on behavior and we're looking at you know, neural data uh, right now, um, but um, that's you know, to, to be stay tuned. But uh, what we really want to know is do dual task networks better mimic human behavior using this, um, the, the behavioral data. So what we have is I, uh, we collected um, uh, behavioral similarity to a large set of face images. So the 80 face images, they differ in gender and age, just some examples here, gender and age and different images of the same person and so on. And we um, collected this behavioral similarity and, and, uh, and basically put this in, in a matrix that you can see here. So this is a representational dissimilarity matrix um, where um, the color indicates how, how similar or dissimilar two images are from each other. And then we can do the same thing based on the activations to the exact same images from the different layers in, in the CNNs that we trained. So that's an example for the face CNN and in, uh, in um, in some fully connect layer in the face CNN. Uh, and so you already see that there's pretty striking um, uh, similarity, um, but we can quantify this by basically just correlating these two matrices, putting them um, in a vector and, uh, and correlating those two vectors. Okay, and that's what we do for every single layer and for all the three networks, the face only, the object only, and the dual task network. And so I'm showing you um, here the results for the face CNN. So it's a correlation over the layers um, with, between the face CNN and the face B and the, the, the human behavior. And in gray is the noise ceiling. Um, so given the, the variability between subjects. And what you see is that, that the correlation um, um, basically steadily increases and we're achieving the, the noise ceiling around layer alpha 13. Okay. So there's a pretty, really, pretty high correlation here. Uh, now we can do the same thing for the object CNN. And now we find that the correlation is much less. 
So it, it doesn't, it's not anywhere near, near the noise ceiling. Something that's interesting though, is that it actually outperforms the face CNN in these early layers, which is something that we see pretty consistently that these early layers are pretty good in, the, they're actually better models of early visual processing than a very specifically trained network. Um, so we can look at the dual task CNN, um, and, um, and that's pretty cool because it basically combines the, the good the, the advantages of both of these networks, right? It has these early, um, these better early, early visual features, but it also has the face specific features and correlates as well as the face CNN with the face behavior in these layers. And then we did the same thing for an object behavioral task. We had uh, images from different object categories, different examples of the same category and so on, and correlated that. And here we find the exact opposite. So now the object CNN correlates much better than the face CNN, while the dual task CNN, again, matches pretty much the performance of the object CNN. So we find that dual task networks correlate well with both face uh, and object behavior, um, while the single train networks um, basically can only explain one and not the other. So we find that dual task networks actually mimic human behavior well, um, and that makes us pretty optimistic that these might be a better model for um, uh, human behavior, but also brains, where we do all these different tasks that are in, like face recognition and object recognition and they are relevant to us. So um, yeah, I just wanna go back here to the questions I raised at the beginning um, about functional specialization in the human visual system. Uh, and so what I uh, think what our results suggest here, why do we have functional specialization for these categories and not others? is that they cannot be performed by relying on common representations, but they need their own distinct set of representations or computations uh, to be performed well, uh, which automatically brings us to the second question too, that it is a good design strategy for brains to, um, to segregate these tasks to perform well on these, on these tasks. Okay, so basically we looked at the case of faces today, um, but um, uh, what we think is it actually um, counts more broadly that the domain-specific organization of the rental pathway may actually reflect a computational optimization for the real-world tasks that humans solve. And, um, you know, and this now opens up a broad, um, a white space of, of questions and, 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 and experiments and studies we can, we can do. Um, so just to give you some examples, um, you know, of this, um, this technique, we definitely want to take this beyond just objects and, and faces and say, you know, what happens when we look at objects and scenes or objects and bodies? Um, um, would we also see segregation for those? Or what about other tasks for which we don't see uh, functional specialization? But then even, um, you know, think about um, artificially synthesizing stimuli to get more at the question of what is it about a task that requires segregation or that makes the system require segregation or specialization. Uh, and that all um, will contribute to better understanding why um, we have functional specialization for some categories and not others in the visual system or beyond. Um, and um, something that I also think is really, really cool that we can look also at within domain um, tasks, such as face expression or identity within the task of faces, see whether they are segregated in, um, in, in those systems and, and how that relates to the brain. But then I would also like to go uh, and basically go, go beyond these large areas that we know since a long, long time or, um, or islands of, of functional specialization and look in a more fine-grained way. Basically taking a network that has been uh, trained on, on hundreds of object categories, perform the same network lesion experiments to see which of those categories, um, which of those categories do we see functional specialized um, units and is that degree of specialization actually predictive for the degree of specialized bits of voxels in the brain, um, yeah, to get at, um, at, at specialization um, in a more fine grained way. And um, yeah, with that, I'd just like to end with an announcement. I will start my own, own lab in the fall um, at Juste Liebig University in, in Gießen in Germany. And so, um, yeah, if you're excited about this work as much as I am and you're looking for doing a PhD or postdoc, um, please reach out, um, ping me, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss. Uh, yeah, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone in my lab um, uh, or in, in the Kenwisha lab. Um, Nancy has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, supervisor, all my collaborators and funders, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>